So normally in an IT security um, conference in France, you get a, a lot of ANSI talks. <laughs> <laughs> and actually this is, I think it's the first ANSI talk uh, at BotConf. Yes, I guess. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. So uh, um, maybe it's a, a sign for uh, more talks in the future. Um, I hope so. Yeah, I, you you had uh, more submissions uh, yeah. this year. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and hopefully uh, next year uh, you'll push more of your colleagues to to do to do work for us. Um, so they work on uh, IT security for uh, uh, critical infrastructure for the French administration. Uh, e every time there's a, an APT quote. Uh, targeting France, uh, they have to work on it. Um, you guys are more from the uh, research, research, research lab, yep. area, and you work with the guys uh, from the, the CERT. So um, they wanted to share about air gap uh, bouncing or going over air gaps with malware communications uh, that make possible uh, new situations for uh, setting up botnets. So you have the floor. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Is it OK for the sound? Yes. yes. Great. Well, uh, good morning, uh, BotConf. Uh, I'm José, and uh, this I'm is Shaoqi. And uh, we are going to present uh, some research we did about uh, the air gap uh, bypass techniques. Uh, this work was made uh, in collaboration with our friend Philippe. Uh, he Which may might be there, yeah. hiding uh, in the crowd. Um, and uh, oh, where is the, the mouse? So uh, we work for the French uh, Network and Information Security Agency, and we belong uh, to the Wireless Security Lab. Uh, our main research topics are uh, electromagnetic threats on information systems, uh, radio communication security, and uh, we do also some uh, embedded system stuff and uh, signal processing. And uh, unfortunately, we are not malware or botnet analysts, but uh, we found other ways to have fun. So the agenda for today, uh, we will uh, present uh, what is an air gap, and uh, then we will um, propose you um, a brief uh, overview of, of uh, recent state-of-the-art techniques uh, for bypassing the air gaps. Uh, then we will present you, uh, um, introduce the intentional electromagnetic interferences, uh, and we will show you how we use this uh, to design a new uh, inbound cover channel to um, send information to uh, an air-gapped computer. And then we will try to uh, uh, give you some recommendations and uh, a short conclusion. So uh, what is an air-gap? Um, in uh, nowadays critical infrastructures, um, the users are facing, uh, are working uh, with uh, uh, several uh, information systems, and uh, these information systems have uh, different levels of criticality and uh, different levels of trust. And uh, one main, one interesting question is, uh, if uh, an untrusted information system gets compromised, um, is it possible to mitigate the risk of uh, uh, malware dissemination or contamination uh, of the trusted ones? And uh, is it possible also to mitigate the other one, which is the exfiltration of data uh, from the trusted information system to the untrusted ones? So I draw a little picture for you. So um, this represents a, a system uh, or a user which has uh, in his day-to-day -day, uh, work uh, to have access to uh, untrusted information systems and uh, critical information systems. This is a simplified view because it's uh, too early in the morning and the social event was yesterday, so uh, I simplified everything for the, the presentation. And um, the risk here is uh, the permeability uh, from the untrusted information system uh, to the, the critical information system. So the idea behind the air gap is to uh, physically separate uh, both information systems. A uh, more formal definition is uh, the air gap is a physical isolation of the information systems, of the sensitive ones, 
Uh, it consists in uh, basically a removal of the communication channels or interfaces uh, with the machines from different less trusted information systems. And uh, the goal is to mitigate the risk of uh, interaction between those information systems. And um, may, um, when you set up um, um, an air gap, you face many, many drawbacks. And the, the first is that it implies a multiplication of the infrastructures. So you have to duplicate the machines, you have to duplicate the networking uh, hardware, and so on. So it costs a lot of money, and uh, you have much less space on your desk, and uh, this increases the, the temptation of using KVM switches, which is uh, not a good idea in this case, and we will see why. Uh, and also, it introduces a lot of work process constraints and uh, organizational constraints for the user in his day-to-day -day, uh, work, uh, because data has still to uh, be shared uh, in some way between the information systems. So uh, there are some uh, equi equipments that the uh, user can use, uh, sanitization devices, and uh, it's a uh, um, very constraining process. So uh, the result is that uh, the day-to-day -day life of uh, users of uh, critical infrastructures, uh, you have uh, many computers, many screens, many keyboards, and uh, less space on the desk. Now we'll uh, shortly present a state of the art of recent uh, techniques. Uh, it's interesting because um, the last three years there, have, there has been a lot of publications about air gap bridging techniques and uh, we are going to pass through them now. So first I will introduce uh, or uh, remind you what is a, a covered channel and then I, we will uh, move on the different techniques that uh, can exploit uh, covered channels to set up a communication channel between an isolated system and uh, the outside world. A uh, covered channel is a technique that uh, allows an information transfer, uh, whether uh, uni or bidirectional, between two entities that are not allowed to communicate uh, through a channel that is not intended for communication. And uh, the main prerequisite for uh, using a covered channel is that the both ends need to uh, know the covered channel and they need to know the communication protocol which, which will go over the, the cover channel uh, to be able to understand each other. So this requires a uh, preliminary infection. So the main hy hypothesis here is that the sensitive uh, machine got infected by a, ma a malware and uh, uh, one of the machines of the untrusted world uh, is also uh, infected with the malware and uh, the main goal of the attacker is to be able to uh, create a communication between those two machines. So the first uh, technique that can be used uh, to uh, bridge an air gap uh, is by using the disabled interfaces. Uh, the way that the administrator will uh, remove the communication interfaces is really important in that case. And um, disab disabling the, the interfaces by software is uh, obviously not enough. And uh, using a hardware, hardware kill switch uh, on the computer may also not be enough, as it has been emphasized by uh, some recent research uh, from uh, some guys from Intel uh, at uh, Hakito Ergosum this year. Uh, they showed that uh, if uh, you can take control of the firmware of a, a networking controller, wireless networking controller, then uh, the hardware kill switch had no effect and the controller was still on. So uh, it, it is still possible to establish a communication uh, outside and it's uh, still possible to communicate from the operating system to the, the malicious firmware. So they have uh, obviously to be uh, physically removed, those interfaces. It's also possible to uh, exploit a covered channel by using uh, uh, shared peripherals. Uh, we uh, peripherals can be used uh, simultaneously or al alternatively uh, between the trusted machine and the untrusted machine. And uh, peripherals uh, are uh, enclosed microcontrollers and memory chips. 
so this gives uh, persistent storage or persistent states and uh, it can be used to uh, uh, exploit a software uh, logical cover channel. Uh, so it is the case for USB devices uh, and uh, more interestingly and surprisingly for uh, display devices which are also equipped with um, uh, memory chips uh, and they are accessible from the operating system and uh, sometimes they are uh, writable. And uh, the KVM switches uh, used uh, uh, with uh, vulnerable display devices uh, can um, uh, make the situation worse. Uh, so to illustrate that, um, usually a KVM allows a direct communication between uh, the acti active host and uh, the display device. So when the flash memory is writable, the active host has the ability to read and write inside that memory chip. And uh, when you switch, the other host becomes active and uh, he has full access to uh, this same flash memory. So this is obviously um, a way to exchange data each time you switch your KVM. Using sound for uh, communicating is uh, known for a while. Uh, it's exactly what I am doing right now. Um, and um, I will cite some uh, techniques that are more related to, to air gaps. Uh, the first one is Google Tone, which is a, a service that uh, has been uh, imagined by Google for sharing information between devices by using uh, um, audio uh, waves. And um, it uses a DTMF modulation uh, on uh, audible frequencies. So uh, the user is aware that uh, communication is going on. Uh, of course, uh, this technique can be transposed to uh, other frequencies. And uh, this gives some examples, some works about uh, using ultrasound uh, to establish a communication channel between uh, two entities. So uh, here the scenario is that the sender has to control a source an audio source, uh, such as an audio output, for example. It can be also the, the fan speed. Uh, and more interestingly, uh, it can also be the emanations from the internal components. Uh, this was uh, uh, published by uh, Shamir, and uh, he has shown that uh, he was able to, uh, by listening to the acoustical emanations of the internal components of a machine, uh, to uh, perform a cryptanalysis uh, on uh, RSA uh, ciphering and deciphering operations. So what that means is that uh, uh, if uh, the attacker can control the operations that are uh, being processed uh, on the machine, uh, he can um, use that and exploit the emanations from the internal components to send the data. And the receiver has to, uh, to control the audio uh, input, uh, so it can be from a microphone or uh, the gyroscope. Uh, there, there has been some research also about that. Um, they used uh, the gyroscope of uh, a smartphone uh, that was uh, on a table, and they have been able to um, reconstruct the speech uh, data uh, of the people that were speaking around the table just by using the, the vibrations. It's also possible to use light to, to establish a communication channel. Um, I refer here, for example, to the, again, Shamir and his keynote uh, last year at Black Hat. Uh, it is depicted here. Um, but basically here, the sender has to control a light source. Uh, this can be the display uh, of a computer. This can be the, the LEDs on the keyboard, for example. And uh, we can also imagine controlling uh, smart light bulbs. Um, and the receiver has to control a light sensor. Some people at uh, Ben Gurion University uh, has pro have proposed a, a technique for bridging air gaps by uh, using temperature as a physical layer to communicate. Uh, their proof of concept is called Bit Whisper. And um, here the sender controls the temperature. Uh, it can be by controlling the room's heating system, for example, or uh, what they proposed to is, was to uh, use the CPU activity to increase the one machine's temperature, and in their scenario, uh, a second machine, which was close enough to the first machine, 
um, was able to use one of uh, its many uh, temperature sensors to monitor the temperature activity and uh, use that to receive uh, information. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, it's, it can take a while to transmit uh, a bit of information. But it's an interesting idea. And finally, uh, it is also possible to use uh, radio frequency waves to communicate. Uh, here I'm going to refer to three uh, works that have uh, been published uh, in the last two years. The first one is uh, really interesting, is a uh, Fantena. And uh, here the idea is, is to exploit uh, controllable uh, wires or lines uh, inside the device and use them as a, an antenna to send data. Uh, so uh, their proof of, of concept was presented at uh, CCC uh, last year, I guess. And um, they showed that uh, by uh, compromising uh, the firmware of um, a Cisco phone, uh, they were able to modulate uh, uh, an electrical signal on uh, an unused wire. Uh, and they used that to um, modulate uh, AM and FM uh, signals and to exfiltrate data. Uh, through the, the phone. Um, Airhopper and uh, GSMEM uh, are uh, also uh, research uh, proof of concepts uh, presented by uh, Ben-Gurion Uni ben -Gurion University. Uh, and they exploit uh, internal components uh, RF leakage, so it's uh, the, the same idea as Tempest, uh, if you know. Um, and um, in their first proof of concept, the Airhopper, uh, they exploit the leaking video display uh, emanations uh, to uh, communicate. Uh, it's um, a rebranding of uh, the well-known uh, Tempest for ELISA, uh, which uh, was made public uh, in the early uh, th 2000s, or I guess, I think it's 2001. And uh, basically, they use the, um, the radio, uh, the electromagnetic leakage of uh, the display uh, and they uh, modulate uh, their data um, on the video stream that is sent to the display. And uh, in Tempest for ELISA, the proposal was to use uh, amplitude modulation. And here in uh, Airhopper, what's interesting is that they modulate in frequency. And um, thus, uh, they make it possible for uh, uh, considering an untrusted system uh, as a phone, a mobile phone, uh, that is uh, FM radio capable. And uh, the uh, compromised mobile phone is uh, able to uh, receive the data and uh, exfiltrate the data through the 3G network. And finally, uh, GSM-EM is the same idea. They use the, the electromagnetic leakage uh, that happens when uh, the CPU accesses the, the memory. And uh, they proved that uh, uh, for the specific equipment that they were uh, testing, um, the leakage was uh, in the GSM frequencies. So they imagined a scenario where um, um, a mobile phone with a custom baseband firmware uh, was able to receive uh, these emanations, these radio emanations, and uh, to exfiltrate them. Uh. And today, uh, we are going to present you uh, a new technique to send data to an isolated uh, computer uh, by using intentional electromagnetic interferences uh, and playing with the, the target's temperature sensors. This is a, a short summary of the, um, the effectiveness of the different techniques I, I presented you. Uh, but as we will discuss the, in the end of the, the talk, uh, this is just to have an idea because it's not a a reliable way to uh, really compare the, the different techniques for uh, communicating. And I guess it's uh, your turn. Thank you, Jose. So hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Shauki. I'm going to talk about intentional electromagnetic interferences and what's, what can we do with such uh, system. So basically, I will first present you very briefly what's uh, electromagnetic compatibility and information security. Then I will just provide you the, 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 the official definition of IMI and some classification of effects induced by IMI on electronic devices uh, and some uh, summarize the effects on uh, targeted computer in our uh, lab. 
So basically, uh, electromagnetic compatibility is related to uh, electromagnetic noise generated by electronic devices, uh, called so defined as uh, emanations. And the susceptibility of electronic devices when exposed to parasitic field. And when, uh, so in our case, we are mostly uh, involved in the analysis of this electromagnetic, electromagnetic noise generated by electronic devices in order to recover uh, possibly the information processed by the information system. So that, that topic is called Tempest. Um, you may have heard about the research of uh, Kuhn in Cambridge. Um, so during the last 10 years, where he was, uh, he shown that we were able to recover the um, uh, computer uh, video screen by analyzing the electromagnetic emanations. When going into electronic system, we also can uh, estimate or analyze the electromagnetic emanations on smart curves and crypto systems. So this topic is called side channels attacks. And so that's uh, related to emanations security. And when trying to induce faults on systems and possibly damage electronic device using high power sources, um, we are much more related to intentional electromagnetic interference. Um, there is also uh, our last uh, paper published uh, four months ago where we have shown that we were also able to inject voice command into smartphones through, by using uh, electromagnetic hyper sources. Um, and today we're going to talk about um, so covert channels and re when related back to uh, EMC and info security, um, we have the emanations. So that's for data exfiltration and by uh, uh, involving the susceptibility of electronic devices, uh, we will try to inject data if possible. So I, what's IMI? IMI is uh, the use of intentional malicious generation of electromagnetic energy. So introducing noise or signals into electronic devices, uh, thus disrupting, confusing, or damaging the system for terrorist or criminal purposes. So it was uh, officially defined at the uh, Zurich EMC Symposium in 1999 and later uh, uh, put inside the e EIC standard. So here we have the reference in 2005. So in our case, uh, we wanted to use so high power sources in order to check if it's possible to gain access to electronic devices and especially uh, IT systems. So when exposing uh, electronic devices to parasitic fields, you may, you may want to analyze and classify the effects induced by parasitic field. So here, the, this is the table and the levels provided by Dr. Sarbat in 2008. And it defines several levels of effects induced on systems. And we have been working together during the last two years in order to, to, to remove the ambiguity between the unknown effects that you may have missed during the test and the no effect level. That means that you are sure that there is no effect on your system. So we applied these methods in the characterization of the susceptibility of uh, computers. And we have seen that it's really uh, easy to apply these classifications. We will show you some results a few later. But the main drawbacks we had about this technique is that it's a high level methodology and it does not allow analyzing the effect induced of electromagnetic perturbations on each subcomponent of the system. And the solution we have found is to uh, recursively apply this technique combined with log events and to, to record them and to analyze them in real time during parasitic exposure so that we are able to uh, analyze the behavior of the system when exposed to parasitic field. So what we did, we, 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 we put some computers inside the Faraday cage because we are generating sometimes large amount of power. And for regulation purpose, we have to do that in a Faraday cage. But what we can do inside, it's the same that what we can do outside the Faraday cage. So that's not uh, uh, some uh, limitation of the, the work we have done. 
So we put this computer and, uh, and we had another, another computer which was uh, connected to this uh, uh, targeted device. And we like USRPs, so we decided to generate signals with uh, USRPs. Um, so we used an antenna for doing radiation uh, testing. And we also put uh, an injection probe into the pro network in order to see if we were able to induce perturbations and also if we were able to exploit this uh, way of attacking uh, information system. So here we have the main effects on the IT system. So we use USB keyboards and also PS2 keyboards. And by analyzing in real time the logs on the, the computers so running Linux, we have seen that we were able to, to induce faults on the PS2 lines. So here we have a brief uh, overview of what kind of logs we may record. Uh, we also had some USB links error, so we have seen that it was able to detect that some IMI problems were occurring, so here it's the first line. And we also were able to, to modify and to corrupt some descriptor inside the, the, U, in the USB protocol, so that was also an interesting uh, effect. We also monitored the uh, errors on the internet, Ethernet uh, link. And we have seen that when exposing the, the system to IMI, we have shown that we have a, lo a high increase of errors on that network. So we also were able to, to record that kind of effect. And the computer has also several temperature sensors. And we wanted to, to see if we were able to disturb such sensors. And here you have an overview of the, the, recorded, the recording of the temperature uh, of the CPU temperature sensor. Uh, in function of the time, and we can see that when exposing the, the IT system, we were able to corrupt the data recorded by the system. So you may imagine that if you have uh, some uh, warnings and uh, some uh, action taken by the computer, like uh, to stop or to reboot due to an increase of temper the temperature, we may be able to trigger this by using IMI on the targeted system. And based on this, we, we went a little bit further, and that's this part. So how we explored IMI effect in order to set up a cover channel to inject data into a computer which was um, so compromised with a malware listening to, to one or two sensor. And so I will show you so the main hypothesis in, in this, uh, for this test. Uh, and we will talk about the channel, channel coding and the frame decomposition we have defined for this test. In fact, when the field amplitude rises, we have seen that the measured temperature rises. And it's um, an instantaneous rising of the temperature. So it's directly related to the uh, IMI uh, amplitude, field amplitude. And here we have some results for several frequencies. Uh, you have here the temperature reading error and the, minimum, the mean field strength required to, in, to induce such reading error. And in the same times, as I told you, we were able to record and to get all uh, collateral effects induced by our sources. And we have seen that uh, for some frequencies and for high field amplitude, that the fan speed uh, start to increase um, and to stop the network interface and also to uh, reboot the computer and sometimes also uh, to damage the computer. So based on this, we wanted to try to inject some uh, specifically crafted uh, signal in order to induce some data into that sensor. And so what we had in mind is to define a mask of data that we use to modulate the uh, continuous wave uh, signal. We generate this signal and uh, check the temperature, the, the current temperature in the computer, which is not the real temperature, but just a fault induced on the reading of that temperature. So it's really, uh, uh, how we say it, um, to disturb the, the reading of the temperature at a specific time. So for sending data, you may want to define some robust channel, uh, a robust channel and conic scheme. And the fir first question you may have is, how can I encode my data? Uh, do I have to define a synchronization, or maybe I don't need that? 
do I have to check the integrity uh, to correct the, the, the corrupted data due to the propagation path and the coupling, the coupling path? And we have seen that basically the transmission was imposed by the effect of IMI, which is the temperature reading error, which imposes to use a NASCA modulation scheme, which is basically an on-off shift keying of the signal. In order to define a, a robust and current scheme, we, we can think a long time on that, but basically people during radio communications have been working for a while, and we just uh, try to define the best way for setting up a good communication channel. So the main limitation we had are the time needed to query the sensor, which is not constant. The sampling of the temperature uh, has some jitter, and we, have see, we know as radio com uh, engineers that uh, the Manchester coding mask clock recovery is easier because there is a transition between each bit uh, transmitted. So that's the, the, the main uh, uh, encoding scheme we defined. And the clock must have a frequency twice higher than the bit rate uh, in order to make it easy uh, that, um, in order that than the bit rate, sorry, and the bit sequence is all with the clock sequence. So that the signal is, is self-contained as it contains the, the clock sequence. Uh, as a consequence, so the clock is included into that signal, and that's why we use that, that scheme. The frame we defined is, uh, has shown here, so we have a preamble, so that the, the, the malicious software is detecting that a command is uh, is under uh, e e emission. Uh, in order to have good autocorrelation function, we used the well-known Barker sequence, which is also used in Bluetooth. So it's a seven-bit uh, uh, seven mask with, uh, prepended with a zero in order to have eight bits, in fact, in our uh, frame. Uh, we also defined the reading of a zero and a one uh, based on the current reading temperature value uh, and we, um, we define a mean temperature sequence in order to check if the signal is over this mean or below this mean so that we can, define, we can recover the zero in the one when it's uh, generated. And for getting one bit, it, uh, we need four measures, so this is based on the sampling theorem. So we define this frame decomposition and that's, that's encoding scheme and the malicious code uh, should be able to, 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 to decode this kind of data we are generating. So here we have the result. So it's basically the temperature uh, read by the, 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 the sensor during parasitic exposure, and that's the uh, containing a command we are sending to the uh, targeted computer. We have also uh, seen that um, when using uh, the, conduct the conducted case, so basically we are connecting the injection probe to the, into the power network, we have seen that we need much less power than the radiated case. So that means that we were able to increase the range between the targeted computer and the source. And concerning the bit rate uh, we expect and we have, uh, we have estimated in doing our measurements, we are able to send 2.5 bits uh, per second. Though to switch back to the uh, summary that uh, Jose showed you uh, a little bit uh, earlier, our method is based on a software and different radio and low cost amplifier. We are targeting the heat sensor like a bit whisper, but in our case we are uh, exploding the effect of electromagnetic uh, interference in order to send data. Uh, it's for data injection inside the computer, which is not classical in uh, the field of uh, curvature channel, uh, which mostly focus on uh, the exfiltration of data and sometimes also the injection, but very few of them. Uh, we have seen that the, the distance between the target and the source can be uh, about five meters in the radiated case, but we were able with less power to go up to 30 meters, and the bit rate is 2.5. So that's, let us switch back to the recommendations. All right. <clears throat> 
So um, now uh, we are going to present you some recommendations. I guess it's more some uh, uh, reasonable uh, thoughts about the, the problem. Uh, so first we address the administrators. And uh, of course, um, we emphasize the necessity to remove any uh, analog or digital I.O. interface. Uh, and um, we insist uh, on the point that uh, uh, we have to, uh, in this case, consider uh, any sensor uh, as an input interface. Uh, so it's not only uh, focusing on the, the network communication interfaces. Uh, of course, try to monitor the remaining ones. Uh, for example, uh, for the temperature sensor, um, noticing uh, uh, very fast increases of uh, temperature is not a realistic uh, uh, case. So uh, it can give a clue that uh, something is going on on the machine. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, the recommendations uh, presented here are not uh, adapted to any kind of uh, machines. It's, uh, only dedicated to uh, really critical machines. So uh, uh, everyone does not need to do that. But uh, it has to be thought uh, accordingly to the, the risk analysis that has been made on the, the considered computers. One question uh, that is interesting is, uh, is, is, is the colocalization with the untrusted devices admissible? And uh, if yes, what is the, the range, the admissive range uh, to be uh, sure that uh, we are safe. Uh, and uh, of course, the <coughs> different uh, tools that uh, are available to uh, push further the isolation uh, are uh, uh, dedicated rooms, uh, blind rooms, uh, faradization is also a, a technology that can be used. Uh, there exist a lot of um, uh, power network filters uh, to um, uh, filter the, the, um, the, the current that is uh, uh, passing through the, the power network uh, and uh, for the sound, the uh, anechoic chambers. Um, and of course, the main point is to, to educa educate the users uh, because uh, as uh, we have seen, the main prerequisite for exploiting this and bypassing air gaps is the primary infection. So if uh, we can uh, limit the probability of primary infection, then uh, the, these problems are uh, not uh, so big problems. So for the users, the main recommendation is to follow the rules and uh, the security policy. <coughs> uh, the air gap uh, robustness, the isolation, uh, relies on the user behavior. Uh, and. Um, uh, specifically because of the main constraints that uh, the air gap uh, implies. Um, and of course, uh, if a computer is uh, totally isolated from uh, untrusted networks, uh, it should not be a reason to deceive um, because it's the best way to introduce a communication channel or to uh, favorize the, the primary infection. Uh, here are some clues for uh, you uh, guys. Um, uh, maybe that's not the, the main points you, you, you try to find when analyzing, analyzing uh, pieces of malware. Uh, but um, if you uh, uh, are interested in, um, in detecting uh, uh, the exploitation of physical cover channels by uh, uh, a malware, uh, that's what you should look for. Uh, the, so first is the enumeration, uh, the discovery of the, the send or receive capabilities of the targeted machine. So the identification of the sensors and the interfaces that uh, allow to send or to receive data. And uh, also uh, the physical layer and Mac layer communication protocol uh, routines. Uh, so the modulation, the detection of the preamble, uh, that uh, Barker sequence, for example, in our case, uh, the decoding or the encoding of data, uh, the error correction codes that can be involved for uh, making the transmission more robust, and of course the packet parsing or frame parsing routines. Um, here a little word to, uh, word to uh, our French uh, researchers that uh, do research for uh, air gap uh, bridging techniques. Um, 
often the results that are presented, and it's the case in the, um, the sheets that uh, we presented here, um, the results are uh, highly related to the test conditions and the proof of concept. Uh, so uh, the physical medium choices, the transmission choices, and uh, part more particularly the target uh, capabilities. So the, the, the sensitivity of the sensors or the emissivity of the target, for example. And um, unfortunately, um, when looking to the results of the, these different research, um, it's uh, really hard to uh, come to a conclusion about the risk and to uh, evaluate and estimate the risk uh, during a risk analysis. Um, so um, our, uh, our um, point of view is that uh, in that uh, particular field, there is a lack of a common metrics uh, to uh, really reliably uh, and scientifically compare the different techniques that are presented. Um, of course, the, the range and the bit rate are uh, really insufficient. Uh, for example, uh, you, you never know if the, the researchers the made the, the best choices uh, in a transmission point of view uh, for the modulation, for the, the encoding, and so on. And maybe the throughput can be uh, increased um, so uh, it's really hard to take that into account uh, in risk uh, analysis. And I let Shauki uh, finish with the conclusion. Thank you, Jose. So in fact, uh, we have shown that uh, we designed a new technique for command channel uh, for a gap computer uh, malware. Uh, we also improved the range and the bit rate, bit rate regating state of the art of cover channels. Um, and another point, so that's what we think about uh, IMI. It's that smart IMI can be an efficient attack vector against IS. So this is the second presentation we do about, about this. Uh, as IMI uh, ca is not limited to general of services attacks uh, as they were uh, designed to, um, we are able, it is more and more affordable to design such uh, electromagnetic uh, high power sources based on uh, numerous uh, software different radio we were able to buy for uh, very, very cheap software different radios. And based on those publications, we think that we should take them into account into risk analysis as we may be able to do very, very uh, malicious uh, activities with uh, IMI. Um, also, ERGAP can be really efficient, but it's very constraining. Uh, and fragile, and based on the publications uh, uh, Jose summarized to you this morning, uh, it still can be uh, bypassed, and there is a real uh, active research activities in the world, so as Jose told you about the Ben Gurion University and other guys, uh, ERGAP uh, bypass techniques are going more and more uh, pub uh, published in the, f in the future, and the main Limitation we, we can see today is that it needs a high attacker profile, and that's something uh, interesting to, 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 to keep in mind. Though uh, here you have some references, uh, you also are able to find them into, in the, the proceedings. Um, thank you very much, and if you have any questions, uh, here we ha you have our email addresses. And thank you again for your attention if you have any questions. We'll, we'll take just one question, so it better be good. First. I hope so. <laughs> uh, it's an amazing work. Uh, thank you. Congratu congratulations. Uh, okay. Have you tried to correct or control the errors, on, uh, for example, on a USB or a PS2, in the way to interact with the computer or maybe uh, change targeted bits? Oh. Um, I, I may go first. Yeah. Um, we, we conceived that the other way. Uh, we tried to uh, design a tool uh, that would uh, uh, more or less reliably detect uh, that there is a, an electromagnetic activity uh, around the target computer uh, by uh, watching uh, these uh, uh, information, these log information. So um, your question was if it was possible to exploit the the, the other logs, the other effects, 
to uh, yes, you had to further communicate uh, and to change bits. Change bits in the the protocol? Uh, no, uh, in the computer. Oh right. Maybe so on the on USB or PS2 to control uh, something. That's an interesting research area. <laughs> we may talk about this a few later when we will remove the mic. <laughs> thank you. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.